Chapter 9 The school gymnasium, forever marred by shoe scuffs and perfumed with sweat, was lined on one side by a long hallway. This led either to the locker rooms or into the gymnasium itself if you pushed open the two swinging doors set with small windows. These allowed Ben to peer through and see that volleyball was being played today. Not one of his favorite sports, but not as bad as some of the others. Still, he couldn't bring himself to enter, even though first period had started 20 minutes ago. Ben had chosen to skate to school instead of taking the bus and had arrived late, despite his intention of attending all of his classes as he had promised his mother yesterday. When he had arrived home on Sunday, he thought he would be greeted with screams and punishments. Instead, things were unsettlingly calm. His father had been the first to see him, pulling a comical lookout face that warned his wife wasn't too pleased with their son. Except his mother hadn't been all that angry. She met Ben in his bedroom, sat down, and very carefully said, You are getting to an age where we can't control you anymore. In less than two years, you will be living on your own. I hope you will be going to college. If you choose to do so, we will help support you. If not, then you are on your own. Until then, you will go to all of your classes, and you won't drink or do drugs in this household. That was it. He wasn't even grounded anymore. His parents had set him free by giving him adult status. Ben had almost felt sad after it had happened, like he was being forced to grow up. He quickly moved past those feelings, though. No longer would he have to deal with curfews or tell them who he was staying with. The new arrangement was ideal for him, which was why he felt horrible that he was breaking his promise already. He hated P.E. There was nothing redeeming about it, and it would never contribute to his health or success later in life. If anything, facing the abuse of the coaches and his peers threatened to make him jaded and mistrustful of the human race. Why should he waste an hour every day in a class that made him feel useless and incompetent? He refused to subject himself to that, no matter the consequences. Ben stayed in the hallway, feeling it was a safe place to hide until the bell rang. Students with flushed faces swarmed out of the locker room. He let them pass without making eye contact, waiting for someone to ask where he had been. It didn't happen until one of the very last people stepped into the hall. Ben, my man, Leon called out happily. Where have you been? I haven't seen you since my wisdom teeth were yanked. I've been skipping a lot of classes lately, Ben confided. Have the coaches said anything about it? Those clueless goons? Of course not. They're too busy reliving their glory years with the second-rate jocks who didn't make the football team. Ben laughed in relief. I wonder how long I can get away with this. I don't know, man. You've got the right idea. Tell you what, if the coaches ever notice you missing, I'll try to cover for you. Thanks, I owe you one. Leon clapped Ben on the shoulder. Hey, I hear your best friend is dating my best friend. Ronnie Adams? Ben asked. I didn't know you guys were friends. Yeah, Ebony and Ivory, that's our band. Ronnie's on guitar and I'm on bass. You should come by with Allison sometime, smoke a J and sing. I crooned out a few tunes with your girl already, but I'd love to hear what a real pair of singers can do. Yeah, all right. Sounds fun. Thanks again for covering for me. No problem, my man. Ben hurried to English class with a weight lifted off his chest. Despite the potential ramifications with his parents, he felt glad not having to worry about showing up for first period anymore. He would have to find something to do, though, now that Tim wasn't accessible. He kept his eyes peeled on the way to class, not certain if Tim would be in school today or not. In English, they had a test, which meant an unwilling competition with Daniel Wigmore, who finished early and spent the remaining time gawking at Ben while mentally timing how long it was taking him to finish. In Spanish class, a few of the kids had come up with a broken Spanish sentence that referred to him as a fat and ugly mariposa. This irritated Ben more because of its stupidity rather than its offensiveness. He might be a mariposa, but there wasn't an ounce of fat on him, and he certainly wasn't ugly when compared to the perpetually awkward idiots who were trying to get a rise out of him. 
Lunch was a singularly trying experience, too, since he had so much he wanted to tell Allison but couldn't without other students overhearing. Keeping things under wraps was crucial if he wanted to have future fun with Tim, and that was one promise Ben was determined to keep. Luckily, there was choir, providing them with uninterrupted free time. Allison was the ideal audience as he spilled the details, gasping and exclaiming at all the juicy parts and asking all the right follow-up questions. Reliving the details with her triggered a longing inside of Ben. He wanted to see Tim again, or at least call him, but part of him was reluctant. What had happened between them had been intense, and now Ben felt it prudent to back off a little. He didn't want to scare Tim off. Plus, it would feel extra satisfying if Tim made the first move. Making the transition back to sixth period wasn't the struggle that first period had been, since Ben genuinely liked Ms. Hughes, even though he wasn't looking forward to explaining why he'd been skipping. He searched his mind for a believable excuse during class, and she kept her eye on him as if he would raise his hand and confess at any moment. By the end of the period, Ben was considering slipping out with the rest of the students when she asked him to stay behind at the last moment. Well? She asked, sitting on the corner of her desk. Ben took a deep breath. He'd already been caught by his parents, so that wasn't a worry, but he could still get in trouble with the school. Then again, he didn't have a good story prepared. There's this guy, he began, Tim Wyman. Ms. Hughes nodded. I have him in my second period. He thinks he's Tom Cruise. Ben laughed and nodded before all the details came pouring out of him. All of it. Even his parents didn't know about Tim's parents being out of town or the ankle injury. Ben was also open with his feelings, hesitating only when he reached the part where they slept together. I think I can imagine the rest, Ms. Hughes said. She was quiet for a moment, making Ben wonder if she was doing just that. Then she said, Sarah Niles. Sorry? Sarah Niles, Ms. Hughes repeated. She used to copy off my tests during freshman year. Dumb as a post, but beautiful. She paused, gauging Ben's reaction and continuing when he nodded with encouragement. Sarah was my first love, ever since she kissed me behind my parents' rose bushes at a birthday party. I would have done anything for her, and I did. She never would have passed physical science if it wasn't for me. Unfortunately, like your Tom Cruise, she wasn't exactly comfortable with herself. So what happened? She promised we could go to the dance together. I knew we couldn't openly go as a couple, but single girls go together all the time and end up dancing together, and no one thinks anything of it. Sarah was popular and liked to keep me a secret but she still promised. The night of the dance, I showed up on my own. We were supposed to meet there, but unbeknownst to either of us, some of Sarah's friends had decided to fix her up with a guy. She was dancing with him when I showed up. Young and brave as I was, I intended to cut in. But then Sarah shook her head. Ben swallowed. And then... And that was it, Ms. Hughes said, straightening up. Love isn't meant to be hidden away, and life is too short for shame. I was lonely a good couple of years, but I met someone just before graduating. Ben thought of the teacher he'd seen Ms. Hughes kiss and wondered if it was her. You're too bright to ruin your academic career for a guy, Ben. I hope you can bring him around to seeing things your way. Being held back a year isn't going to seduce anyone. Ben laughed. So what's my punishment? Cleaning the chalkboard? Ms. Hughes assigned him an essay and went over the details of a test he would have to make up. She could have demanded Ben drop and do push-ups, and he would have gladly complied, if only every adult in his life was as cool as she was. After school, Ben went directly home. He made sure to be a social part of the family for the entire night, helping with dinner, washing dishes, and even being civil to his sister. He wanted his mom to see that she had made the right decision in cutting him some slack. Of course, staying close to home was good, too, just in case Tim decided to call. 
By midnight, when Ben was climbing into bed, it was clear that this wasn't going to happen. As he fell asleep, Ben couldn't help picture Ms. Hughes, young and passionate, striding across the dance floor with determination, but being stopped dead by the shaking of Sarah's head. Wednesday rolled around, and even though it had only been two days, to Ben it seemed like an eternity. Waiting for any sort of signal from Tim was driving Ben crazy, so he decided to try to catch Tim in the hall where he had seen him the first time. There was no sign of him there, so Ben tried again the next day. His persistence paid off. Ben spotted him as he rounded the corner of the hall. Tim was much further down, surrounded by the same snobs and jocks as before. Bryce Hunter was there, repeatedly pointing at his own legs and pantomiming throwing a football and then a tackle. Tim was laughing at his story while leaning on one crutch, his other side occupied by Krista Norman, who had wrapped herself around him like a python. Ben stooped down to fumble with the contents of his backpack while trying to casually keep track of them. Eventually, Krista and Bryce left in the opposite direction, while Tim and Daryl Briscott headed down the hall. Ben stood, shouldered his backpack, and began walking toward them. Daryl wore his standard vacant expression, every available brain cell dedicated to keeping him upright and walking. That left Tim free to notice Ben's stare. Tim held up a hand to his face, one thumb by his ear, pinky in front of his mouth, the universal sign for call me. Ben grinned and nodded before he broke eye contact. Abandoning subtlety, calling was the first thing he did when he got home. The phone rang and rang, and just as he was about to hang up, it clicked and Tim's voice was on the line. Hey, Ben said, having no idea what to say next. Hey, Tim echoed. You have to come get me. I'm totally sick of it here. I don't have a car, Ben reminded him. I think you've driven mine more than I have. Get over here. Ben rushed over to Tim's house, trying not to run. He didn't want to arrive sweaty and disheveled. Tim was waiting for him in the driveway, standing between his car and a white SUV that hadn't been there last week, meaning that at least one of his parents was home. Let's go, Tim said, voice tense as he handed Ben the keys. Everything all right? he inquired. Yes, came the impatient response. Come on! Ben felt uneasy as he unlocked the black sports car and took a seat. He glanced over at Tim, who still hadn't smiled or shown any sign that he was glad to see Ben. Only after they were a few blocks from the house did the tension evaporate, allowing Tim to act like his old self again. Everything all right at home? Ben asked. Yeah, Tim said. I'm just sick of being there, that's all. Ben knew there was more to it than that, but he didn't want to return Tim to his foul mood by playing 20 questions. So where do you want to go? I don't know. Tim leaned over and checked the dashboard. Gas station first. The tank is empty. Sorry about that. I didn't have any cash to fill it up last week. It's all right. Tim pulled out his wallet and slid a plastic card from it. Gas card. My parents pay for all of it. Wow, that's generous of them. Tim shrugged. Well, if you have all the gas in the world, I know exactly where we should go. When do you have to be home? Any time is fine. They won't even notice that I'm gone. After refueling, Ben drove to Interstate 45 and cranked up the music as they headed south. Occasionally, Tim would turn the volume down and ask where they were going. But Ben would only grin and turn the music back up. After an hour of exceeding the speed limit, they were traveling through landscape that began to give way to water and palm trees. Galveston? Tim read from one of the signs. Yeah, Ben confessed. Ever been there? No, what's it like? This is pretty much it. They were crossing the two-mile-long causeway now, a tremendous expanse of road that spanned the huge body of water below. They continued across to Galveston Island, which did its best to appear as a hot tourist attraction, and failed, coming across more like the trashy cousin of Miami. Looks pretty cool, Tim commented as they passed garishly lit restaurants that were just starting to see an influx of patronage. They turned left onto the last stretch of the Seawall Boulevard. Ben kept Tim distracted and looking away from the small area where the Gulf of Mexico could be seen 
and continued driving until they reached the Bolivar Ferry. The stars were shining favorably on Ben that day. The ferry was docked and cars were pulling onto it. Tim sat up, looking more enthusiastic. Once the car was parked, they left it and walked to the front of the boat for a better view. To the east, water stretched out and disappeared into the horizon. Is that the ocean? Tim asked excitedly. That is, isn't it? Yup, Ben said. Well, the Gulf of Mexico, anyway. My dad always calls it the poor man's Atlantic. It's all the same water, right? This is so cool. They stayed on deck during the 20-minute ride, Ben singing sea shanties to make Tim laugh as wind blew through their hair and mist from the waves chilled their skin. When Bolivar Peninsula came into view, they hurried back to the car and impatiently waited for the other cars to disembark ahead of them. They didn't drive far before finding a decent beach. Tourist season was starting to die down, and while it was impossible to find complete solitude, they did find an area unpolluted by sunbathers. Tim's crutches kept sinking into the sand, so they backtracked to solid ground and parked themselves there, enjoying the view. The sky changed its flavor to tropical orange as the sun steadily made its descent, seagulls calling out to each other above the crashing waves. This is the first time I've ever seen the ocean, Tim said, or gulf or whatever. I guess there's nothing like this in Kansas, Ben replied. I figured that you traveled a lot with your parents, though. Not really. They like to take trips on their own, but I've been to Mexico City half a dozen times. My mom's family all live there. What's it like? Beautiful. Very different from here. That's what I like about it. A faraway look came into Tim's eyes as he remembered. I always make them take me to the volcano Popocatépetl. Popo what? Ben snorted. Popocatépetl, Tim repeated. This sent Ben into a fit of laughter. That's what it's called, Tim insisted, before starting to laugh himself. I guess it does sound kind of goofy. I love how you say it with the accent and everything, Ben said once he had calmed down. Can you speak Spanish at all? Fluently. I was raised bilingual. Yeah, it's pretty obvious at this point that you're bi, Ben teased. I'm not, Tim protested. I just get really horny sometimes. Ben tried not to laugh at this, but couldn't help himself. Tim looked insulted, so Ben shoved him playfully and told him to stop taking everything so seriously. I don't care what you are, he said bravely, reaching out to pat Tim on the back. He let his hand linger there. I like you for who you are. It's not the sports car, then? Tim asked as Ben began to run his hand up and down his back. Or the movie star good looks? Are you kidding me? I can barely stand to look at you. The car, on the other hand, is pure sex. <laughs> that she is, Tim grinned. Coche bonita, Ben tried. He was pretty sure it meant beautiful car. He suddenly wished he had paid closer attention in school. Say something to me in Spanish. Like what? Something nice. Tim thought for a while before clearing his throat. He turned and looked Ben directly in the eye before speaking. Enseñame a volar mi mariposa hermosa. The smile faded from Ben's face. He didn't understand all of it, but one word had stood out. Something nice, he complained. Sorry if you didn't like it, Tim responded, appearing offended. Well, I know what mariposa means, and I'm sick of hearing it. Tim scrunched up his face in confusion. Who's been saying mariposa to you? Everyone in my Spanish class, Ben told him. We had a substitute, and someone asked how to say faggot in Spanish. It's not, Tim protested. Oh, man. How could I be so stupid? Mariposa means butterfly. It does? So it's not homophobic? Yeah, well, no. Tim thought about it for a second. It's just like the word fairy in English. You can say it all day long and it doesn't mean anything bad, but call someone that in the right context and it can be offensive. Oh. That explained why Mrs. Vega hadn't reacted when the students kept using that word. In a way, it was kind of cool. 
Basically, everyone was saying butterfly to him. Big deal. Knowing this would make it easier not to react in the future. So what did you say to me then? Ben asked. Forget it, Tim said dismissively. I should have chosen my words better. No, tell me. Maybe later. Ben begged him to reveal what he had said a few more times, but Tim was adamant. Instead, he started digging around in the sand, looking for shells that weren't broken to take as souvenirs. This led to them digging a moat, followed by the inevitable building of a sandcastle. It wasn't the right kind of sand, though, so all they could build was a shapeless mound of sand. Ben made a limp flag out of some seaweed and a stick and stuck it in the top, dubbing it Popocatepetl. The night had finally arrived in full, the temperature dropping. Ben was about to suggest they leave when a laugh came from further down the beach. Raucous voices soon joined it as a group of silhouettes moved toward them. Ben hoped not to be noticed in the dark, but as the strangers passed, there were puzzled murmurs before one of the voices called out. Tim answered, causing a few to scream and the others to giggle. The group walked toward them, the distant streetlights illuminating five girls, all college age or older. Each had a beer in hand, two of them carrying half-empty twelve-packs in the other. The girls were all bony clones of each other, except for one who was stocky and confident. She was the first to speak to them in a thick Bronx accent. What are you two doing out here? On a date or something? No, Tim laughed. What about you? We're not lezzies. Ew, mocked one of the girls in the background to the other's amusement. That one is kind of cute, murmured one of the voices. How old are you guys? challenged the ringleader. Old enough, Tim retorted to their delight. You guys want a beer? Yeah, I need to sit, whined a girl with bleach blonde hair. Let's drink one with them. The girls jostled for position on the sand, ending up forming a circle like some strange council. The ringleader sat directly in front of them while the two prettiest flocked to Tim's side. Nearest Ben was a fair-haired girl with timid posture who risked a sympathetic glance in his direction before looking away. Tim eagerly accepted the beer. Ben turned it down as the designated driver, which caused a round of laughter. They handed him one anyway. He sipped at it moodily, not drinking more than the bare minimum. You guys go to college around here? Asked the brunette nearest to Tim. Yeah, we sure do. He turned and winked openly at Ben. Which one? Tim paused. He hadn't been in Texas long enough to bluff his way through this one. Texas A&M, Ben filled in for him. The college wasn't remotely local, but the girls didn't react, proving they were here on vacation. They barely acknowledged his response. All attention was focused on Tim, like dogs eyeing a juicy piece of meat. Ben hoped this wasn't how he usually appeared. They continued grilling Tim through his first beer. By his second, they were trying to outdo each other to gain his approval. Some told of their raunchy exploits back home. One tried humor and failed miserably. The girl nearest to Tim relied on physical charm, finding excuses to make bodily contact with him. So far, she seemed to be in the lead. Only the bashful girl next to Ben refrained from these games. She started a cautious conversation with Ben about what life was like in Texas, which he found hard to focus on while keeping an eye on the proceedings. When Tim stood to answer a call of nature, the brunette rose with him, wrapping an arm around his torso to help him walk. This caused a chorus of oohs from the other girls that set Ben's teeth on edge. He tried to follow them with his eyes as they left, but they were soon lost to the dark. It was hard to judge how much time passed before they came back, but every minute was grueling. When Tim did show his face again, he was grinning. I'm afraid, ladies, that we must take our leave, he said. No way, come and party at our hotel, the brunette insisted. Tell us where you're staying and we might come by later, he suggested. Ben couldn't wait to leave as they all clamored to give Tim the information. He didn't say anything further until they were back on the ferry, looking over the edge at the churning water below. That brunette sure seemed fond of you, Ben prompted, making sure to keep his voice neutral. He was certain that acting jealous wasn't going to earn him any points.
Yeah, she was all over me when I went to pee. Really? Ben asked, visualizing the girl being swept away by the tides while he pointed and laughed. What happened? Nothing much, Tim smiled coyly. She shoved her tongue down my throat and started groping me, but I really had to piss. I barely managed to push her away so I could. That's it? Well, I felt her up. She had a pretty nice body. I'm surprised she didn't go down on you then and there, Ben commented, hoping that Tim wouldn't say that she did. I bet she would have, yeah. But whatever. You don't sound very enthusiastic about the idea. I don't know, man. Tim turned his back to the water and leaned against the rail. She was hot and all, but after everything that went down in Kansas because my ex-girlfriend said I raped her, I don't want something like that to happen again. The whole school turned against me. It's just not worth it. I promised myself to only sleep with people who mean something to me. This statement blew away Ben's foul mood. He meant something to Tim. Or maybe he wasn't worried about a gay guy running around school saying he'd been raped. Such a claim wouldn't be taken very seriously. Regardless, Ben chose to take this as a compliment. Tim had a CD he wanted to listen to on the way home, giving Ben time to think while it blared from the speakers. What happened on the beach tonight had really opened his eyes. Girls found Tim just as irresistible as he did, which came as no surprise. Right now, Tim was with Krista, who had a number of hang-ups, but it was only a matter of time before a girl came along who wasn't put off by the European standard. One who would be more than happy to fulfill Tim's sexual desires once she had gained his trust. When that happened, Ben would be thrown out with the weekly garbage. If Tim was gay, or even bisexual, Ben had only a limited time to make him realize it before a different girl moved in on his territory. Maybe it was just wishful thinking on his part, but Tim was so affectionate, so giving when they had sex. It was totally different than the other guys. But what if he was wrong? What if Tim really was straight and pushing the issue only ended up destroying what they had right now? They pulled into Tim's driveway just before midnight. He didn't seem concerned about the hour. Obviously, his parents kept him on a long leash as well. You really don't mind walking home? Tim asked him. I'm sure I can manage driving there and back. No, I'll be fine. All right. They stood there awkwardly for a moment. Isn't this where the goodnight kiss was supposed to take place? Enseñame a volar mi mariposa hermosa, Tim said suddenly. It's from a poem I... Well, it's from a poem. What's it mean? Teach me how to fly, my beautiful butterfly. He reached out and ruffled Ben's hair, his version of a parting kiss. See you around. Ben watched Tim enter the house before making his way down the street, no longer uncertain. He would help Tim realize who he really was. He would teach him how to fly. Two young men discover what it means to be friends, lovers, and sometimes even enemies in Something Like Summer. Available as an audiobook, ebook, or paperback at your favorite retailer.